to say it this morning, but isn't Ladies Monday a wonderful thing? <laughs> I feel particularly blessed that my inexpertise has qualified me to speak from this podium this Sunday morning. I also really appreciate this denomination and this congregation for welcoming an additional perspective, for tolerating a break from the usual. In that spirit, my topic of interest today is rest, specifically the Sabbath day created for its provision. Would you please bow your heads with me? Dear God, please bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts as we come to you this morning. For you have created time and space, restoration and meaning. In your name we pray, Amen. Moments ago, we listened to the fourth of the Ten Commandments read from the Bible. They were communicated to Moses by God after God liberated the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. I'll repeat Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Remember the Sabbath day. I remember the Sabbath day, that is, remembered about the Sabbath, when I was thinking about what I would say to you all this morning. My remembering the Sabbath as a concept, the fact of the Sabbath, is not, I suspect, what God had in mind in Exodus, which is probably more of an invitation to experience the Sabbath. I imagine God intended something a little more sustained or active in their command to remember. The fourth commandment is dear to me because it shaped the Sabbath rituals of my childhood and adolescence as a Seventh-day Adventist. Following my parents' lead, I tried my best to adhere to the rules protecting the holiness of Saturday, our Sabbath day. The practices of the Christian Adventist denomination are different than those of Jewish Sabbath keeping, which you might be more familiar with. But I'll borrow some language anyway from Jewish scholar Abraham Joshua Heschel when I describe the Sabbath as a day expressed in abstentions. That is, the rules for Sabbath are more about what you can't do than what you can. Just as theologians can most easily describe the mystery of God by saying what God is not, the community I grew up in experienced the Sabbath in terms of the everyday activities we were not permitted to do on that day. As Adventists, we were still allowed to cook and dry and use our electricity, but I never picked up extra life burning shifts on Saturday. We weren't supposed to eat out or use the money we, by which I mean my parents, earned during the work week. Nor did we like to engage in activities that relied on the work of other people. From sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday, the exact number was always posted in the last week's bulletin. We didn't do homework, watch secular TV, or listen to mainstream radio stations. These have not been my practices for many years now, for various reasons. Once in college, the demands of my education did not easily submit to the restrictions of the Sabbath. I was waiting tables by 6 a.m. on Saturdays and struggling to finish my assigned readings before my Monday classes with a little time left over. It felt like there was no time to rest, let alone languish in the spirit. Less practically, but more powerfully, I think, the conceptual division between the sacred and the secular that used to separate Sabbath activities from all those others was disappearing in my mind. To me, for example, there used to be regular music with themes of love and angst that I would listen to six days of the week. But on the Sabbath, I would listen to songs of God or Jesus in the lyrics. My earnest and sometimes rigid observances were made easier by black and white thinking. But as I've gotten older, it has felt like fewer and fewer things can properly be called not holy. And so they shouldn't really be excluded from a holy day. But if everything is holy, what makes Sabbath so different? Of what should it consist if all is permitted? Even when there were things I wouldn't do on Sabbath, I did not experience it as a day of deprivation. At least that's not how I remember it now. Whether a characteristic of youth in general or my spiritual tradition in particular, I look back on the tranquility and repose of the day because striving and ambition was banned. Perhaps for this reason, Sabbath was not very solitary. Not being permitted to go to the movies or eat out, for example, Adventist families had no choice but to spend time with one another for their entertainment. A favorite tradition of mine was the Saturday afternoons my family spent with our friends at Zoom Hall. We ate a dinner of popcorn, cheese, and homemade jalapeno poppers, and fired up the movies as soon as the sun went down. <laughs> With the habits and routine of the work week and school days put aside, 
there was an opportunity for something other to emerge. I sometimes catch glimmers of the Sabbath, a deja vu, even now, after sundown in my own apartment. With the TV off, the carpet visible and vacuumed, and the living room lit by lamplight, I have been known to explain to Michael, it feels like Sabbath in here. This phrase gives me a bit of a chuckle because it's so contradictory. The Sabbath, a concept of time, is located here, a location in space. Now, I'm going to stop myself before I wax too philosophical about the distinction between time and space. But it does matter that what God has provided, sanctified for us, and what we are commanded to keep holy, is a day and not a thing, a location, or an artifact. Heschel describes time in his book, The Sabbath, as eternity in disguise, because it is where you can find God's likeness, not necessarily in the mountain tops or in the sea, but within time itself. So what is that supposed to mean for our daily lives? How does the existence of Sabbath and our practice of keeping it holy enrich our experience of God, of others, of ourselves? To answer this question, let's return to God's instruction to remember the Sabbath. People who know the story of Genesis, as the Israelites would have, would have been acquainted with the Sabbath since its origin at the beginning of time. After six days of sculpting creation, God finished on the seventh day and blessed it, setting it apart. So the Sabbath is not a new premise. It requires recollection, remembrance, rather than introduction. The practice of keeping the Sabbath holy must be continued from the past into the present. In the very beginning, as recorded in Genesis, God creates heaven and earth and brings forth light. God then distinguishes between light and darkness, what will later become day and night. The origin story begins with the creation of days themselves a metric by which to observe and enumerate the passage of time. Heschel says, at the beginning time was one, eternal, but time undivided, time eternal, would be unrelated to the world of space. So time was divided into seven days and entered into an intimate relationship with the world of space. Having created a distinction in time, on the second day God creates a distinction in space, separating sky from sea, the subsequent days result in vegetation, sun, moon, and stars, and all kinds of creatures, culminating in humanity. All is good. So what was created on the seventh day, anything? What was still yet to be? On the seventh day, God finished their work and rested, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. I take this to mean that something was created, the Sabbath. The seventh day itself was the real culmination of creation. This means that the tranquility of Sabbath does not arise merely from a lack of labor, but is a new kind of being unto itself, created by God. Our participation in Sabbath is important. Sabbath is the first thing God hallows or calls holy in the Bible. Even in the Ten Commandments, there is no mention of a sacred place, only a sacred day. It is not until the Israelites began worshiping a golden calf in the desert that God even commands them to build a tabernacle at all, holiness in space. So why this emphasis on time versus space? Partly, I think, because it's so easy to focus solely on the dimension of our existence that we can see. The accoutrement of civilization and the fruits of our labor, the things of space, are attractive and consuming and also certainly necessary for our survival. There's a reason that six days of the week can and should be reserved for labor. Of course, we are grateful for our American five-day work week, but God allows up to six in special circumstances. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course, but I think it's important to emphasize that honoring the Sabbath is not an elevation of leisure in general. The flourishing of our world and the thriving of our sisters and brothers depends on our helping hands. It specifically toil and not labor that was the curse bestowed upon Adam as he was expelled from the Garden of Eden. So back to why God has commanded us to remember the Sabbath. Not only is it a recollection from the creation story, it's also simply a hard thing to remember to do. In part because the activities of keeping holy aren't clearly defined, and in part because the consecration of time stands in opposition to the human tendency to accrue things 
or objects that take up space. God says, remember, so that people do not forget, unconsciously or willfully. The practice of Sabbath keeping must be cultivated in the present and maintained into the future. It's so common to spend our days bartering time and labor for acquisition in space. Even if these aren't always literal plots of land or mortgage payments for the houses that fit upon them, we often sacrifice our time to accrue things that are temporary, even if they're not at all frivolous. I know I do. My sense of worthiness depends largely on what I can produce. So what would it mean for the way we could live each day if God intends for us to dedicate ourselves to the pursuit of eternity? Let me be clear, I'm not talking about an infinite extension of time and a great beyond when I say eternity. I can't know about that. But at the very least, I'm led to believe that there is an infinite capacity for spirit within every given moment. Heschel posits that the Sabbath day and our actions within it ought to be reserved for developing the taste for eternity. After all, don't we have to be able to recognize the kingdom when it comes? Now, I don't really mean that how it sounds. I don't necessarily think that we're awaiting the sudden arrival of a kingdom, a moment when our existence really starts to matter, when the Sabbath gets real. But I do mean it. I do want to be able to recognize the capital K kingdom, the one where God's will is done on earth as in heaven, largely because I believe I have to be an actor in its arrival, that is, our societal progress towards an earthly ideal. If Sabbath is the presence of God in time, I absolutely want to be able to have a taste for it. Things seem to have gotten pretty theoretical, and I do want to put my feet back on the ground. But first, I wonder if talking in abstract terms is sort of the point when it comes to the Sabbath and God. It's easier to fit concepts into recognizable forms, certainly. But that doesn't make it accurate. Those forms can obscure reality instead of looking at it. Heschel remarks that, to most of us a person, a human being, seems to be a maximum being, the ceiling of reality. We think that to personify is to glorify. Yet do not some of us realize at times that a person is no superlative, that to personify the spiritually real is to belittle it? A personification may be both a distortion and an appreciation. I think we do well to keep the same point in mind whenever we're dealing with abstract spiritual matters. It's tempting to say that the Sabbath is about abstaining from X or incorporating Y, but it may be further from the point. You may have noticed I have little to say about how to keep the Sabbath, and I want you to think that I've done it on purpose. With respect to why it matters, I hope we've made some progress there. God has planted within us and within our world eternal life. I don't know what that means for what occurs after death, but at the least, I think we are meant to experience a wellspring of vitality within our daily lives, to find great meaning this side of the heaven. I know it is a great privilege for me to espouse the benefits of a day of rest. I hope I have spoken in sufficiently broad terms about when in a week or for how long the spirit of Sabbath could be felt. For I know there are many people who can't afford a day of it. There are many people for whom their work isn't really relegated to a schedule. Caretakers and parents come to mind as some of many. Some others, like the pastor and the servants of the church, work because it's our Sabbath day. But no matter what your days look like or where you spend them, I encourage you to ask yourselves what it would mean to recognize, remember, their holiness. We need not imbue our hours with sanctity. God has done that already. Sabbath was God's first gift to us. May we remember it. <laughs>